Anxiety is telling us that we're lost in the fundamental delusion of solidness and separateness, that we don't really get the Buddhist notion of emptiness. A direct experience of emptiness and then being able to stabilize emptiness can be a way of working with anxiety. Welcome to Dale Borglum's Healing at the Edge. We are very happy to share with you Dale's profound insight and open heart. Please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dale to support this podcast. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you again. Today, I would like to talk about anxiety and emptiness. Last uh, meeting, a couple weeks ago, we talked about using emotions as the gateway to presence, transmuting emotions. And the more I looked at this, particularly in my own life, and I really have to confess that the talk I'm giving is as much a talk to myself as anyone I've ever given. This is my work right now, and I hope it could be useful for you also. Anxiety is not the same as fear. One of my teachers, Prungpa Rinpoche, said that when you're on the path, anxiety will arise. Awakening warriors would find themselves in a constant state of anxiety. And we might as well get to know the anxiety. My sense of it is that a lot of people who aren't on the path don't really know they're anxious all the time. And then when we get on the path, not only do we begin to notice the anxiety, but anxiety is being created by the unwinding of our emotional patterns. Yes, it's true from a tantric standpoint that emotions have a healing message. And according to our dear friend Sigmund Freud, the message of anxiety is to act. But I think that's a very limited view that we can begin to notice the difference between acting from anxiety and acting from a sense of openness at a deeper level. And this is what I'd like to really talk about and explore together today. Anxiety is telling us that we're lost in the fundamental delusion of solidness and separateness, that we don't really get the Buddhist notion of emptiness a direct experience of emptiness and then being able to stabilize emptiness can be a way of working with anxiety. And even when people are meditating, they very often don't include or feel their anxiety. In other words, there is this fundamental contraction that is the cause of all suffering, the contraction that we believe we're separate, we're independent, we're solid, and we'll get into what that means. I mean, yes, there is a solid chair that you are sitting on. Yes, there is a body that has blood pumping through it. But at the same time, we make this fundamental mistake about how real and solid that actually is. By beginning to investigate, experience directly, and stabilize emptiness, it will begin to dissolve this, this pervasive anxiety that is there so constantly and there is no contrast to it because we're always living in it. So that what I'm saying is because we are lost in this fundamental delusion where we think we're solid and there's a real self in, in a way that we'll investigate in a few minutes, because there's no contrast to that, we don't feel the anxiety. We don't feel how lost we are. My sense of it is that by beginning to investigate this, it really is at the root of all the other difficult emotions that arise and keep us caught. All of the anger, all of the fear, all of the grief that we're lost in is arising out of this fundamental misperception of who we are. Reality itself is very uncomplicated. Delusion is complicated, okay? Reality is uncomplicated. Delusion is complicated. By going beyond emptiness to experiencing emptiness, not just thinking about it, not reading all these 
Buddhist books. And I will admit that I've been studying Buddhism for over 50 years and have always been rather not only bothered by put off by this notion of emptiness until I began to experience it directly. It's on one hand, a very simple, so simple of a, a concept that it, it's hard to grasp, that it's, it's so really apparent that when we really look closely at anything, including yourself, you will find that there's nothing that's really solid, permanent, and independent that form doesn't have an independent existence, that form is the result of consciousness. So first we recognize this, and then we experience it, and we bring that into our direct experience in an ongoing, stabilized way. One of the sutras, Buddhist sutras, says that when there is grasping itself, discrimination between self and others arises, emotions and afflictions then follow. It's essential here to distinguish between the self that exists conventionally. I'm sitting in Fairfax, I'm talking into a microphone, you're sitting where you are, maybe you're walking around. And to distinguish between that conventional self and the self that doesn't exist at all, the self that we reify in a sense of solidness that isn't actually happening. In a normal day-to-day -day way, you say, I'm meditating, I'm cultivating compassion. Uh, but a problem arises when the sense of self becomes too extreme. And we start to think of it as this independent and autonomous being as real. And we cling to this notion, and that is the root of our separateness. I mentioned in the meeting a couple of weeks ago how I was lying in bed and couldn't fall asleep and decided instead of taking an herbal supplement or doing something like that, that I would just investigate this feeling of leaning into it, befriending in a tantric sense, this agitated energy that wasn't really based on anything. And the more I thought about it, it's really based on this anxiety. And by going into the anxiety, particularly as I was feeling it in my body, it began to reveal a sense of emptiness, of spaciousness. And in that, then when my thoughts arose, I could see how each thought was based in I, how each thought was based in this conceptual relationship with reality that when I examined it was, had really nothing to stand on, if you will. And as that fell away, there was nobody there to think and I couldn't think. And even for a short amount of time, it was there was a sense of fear that arose because there wasn't a me, there wasn't a thinker, there wasn't anything happening. So through meditative analytical investigation, we can begin to go to the root of all the afflictions that we're feeling and begin to see that this natural sense of self where we're feeling that we're so solid is really mistaken. On one hand, emptiness creates this anxiety. But on the other hand, working with this fundamental anxiety is the way to revealing the empty nature of things. When we say things are not solid, when we say things are really not independent, things are empty, what we're really saying is it's a different way of perceiving things. We're actually perceiving the same thing in a different way, that a material object is not the way we think it is. What I'd like to talk about now is a recent study done at a British university where they got a bunch of meditators who were fairly advanced meditators, and they had them do two things. For a bunch of weeks, they did mindfulness meditation, and then for another bunch of weeks, they did meditation on emptiness. And what they found out is when these people were meditating on emptiness, there was a 24% decrease in negative emotions and a 16% increase in compassionate feelings and a 10% reduction in attachment to themselves and their external experiences. They didn't do this for people who were novices, who had never meditated before. The emptiness meditation consisted of an, an initial phase of concentrated meditation, followed by a phase of investigative meditation in which they searched for an existing self and examine the underlying nature of experience, and then transcending conceptual boundaries, 
in order to obtain a universal farsighted outlook rooted in compassion. So in Buddhism, compassion is based on understanding the nature of the heart is an empty heart. Empty can be a threatening word because it sounds like there's nothing there. Nothing doesn't exist. Empty means empty of concept. Maybe spaciousness is a word that suits you better than other words, but to have a heart mind that is empty of concept, particularly this grasping at a separate self, unveils, reveals the compassionate nature that we are already. And if we really even look at Mahayana Buddhism, where they take the Bodhisattva vow, where they say, sentient beings are numberless, I vow to save them. Desires are inexhaustible, I vow to put an end to them, to more of them that I'm not going to repeat right now. It seems impossible to think that I am going to save all sentient beings. But when we really understand emptiness, there's not I and all sentient beings. There's not I who has to get rid of all desire. So that when we get beyond this fundamental delusion, the bodhisattva vow becomes doable. In fact, there, there isn't something to do because we're there already. Somebody once asked Maharaji, is reality real? He said, it's completely real. It's completely a dream. And it's both at the same time. And what we're talking about here today is beginning to appreciate the dreamlike nature of things. In the Heart Sutra, it begins, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. And form is emptiness is a very difficult thing to experience and then even more difficult to stabilize. What does it mean form is emptiness? What does it mean when we look at the people on the screen? They look like pretty non-empty people. They look pretty solid. And this investigation we're talking about today of form is emptiness, but at the same time, emptiness is form. It's not just only a dream. It's like Maharaji said, it's both at the same time. So can we begin to learn to live in this world where it's a dream and it's real at the same time? where we, we are appreciating the empty nature of reality at the same time as we're seeing that people are suffering. There's a war going on. A pandemic just happened. Donald Trump got indicted again for who knows what yesterday or the day before. All these things are really happening, and they're also a dream. Over the last 98 meetings that we've done here together, we've talked a lot about compassion and working with emotions and becoming embodied and getting grounded and centered and all of these grosser emotions and sensations and ways of healing ourselves and what we're getting at today is underneath all of that is one simple thing to be done that dissolves all of the other problems but it's exceedingly difficult because this anxiety that underlies it all is so pervasive. So that Ramdas had this wonderful line about spiritual practice that it's like jumping out of an airplane and partway down realizing you don't have on a parachute. And then further the way down realizing it's okay because there's no ground. But obviously there's going to be a lot of anxiety in that time frame between no parachute and no ground, that there might be a ground coming up. Right? And that's where we're living, particularly as we've dove into practice and we haven't really gotten that there is no ground that it's just free fall suzuki roshi said that spiritual practice is like getting on a ship that's going on into the ocean and realizing it's going to sink okay <laughs> so uh we're all in that predicament the great philosopher yogi Berra, who for those of you who aren't old enough don't know that he was a catcher for the New York Yankees, said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, right? And, <laughs> and the point here is that when you're in that state of emptiness, you just take the fork. I mean, it's like before that, there's the anxiety, do I go right or do I go left? And no, you just take the fork in the road. And maybe there's no way to take the fork in the road. 
this quality of compassion arising naturally out of emptiness or compassion revealing the empty nature of things gives us a clue of how to do this. The first thing is beginning to be aware of that sense of underlying anxiety. What does it feel like in your body? Can you be with it without conceptualizing it? That in an ongoing way, just noticing, for instance, the way the mind is wandering. Why is the mind wandering all the time? Doesn't the mind feel a lot better? Don't you feel a lot better when the mind is calm and stable? But the, the wandering mind is the manifestation of resistance to the empty nature of things, of trying to keep thinking of having something going on so that the empty nature is not present and doesn't scare us. Anxiety actually comes from a root word, meaning narrower, tight place. So that being in this prison of anxiety, this tight place, even though it's very uncomfortable, is preferable to resting in this vast spaciousness beyond anxiety. We aren't aware of the depth of our waking sleep. We underestimate our resistance to letting go and to staying attached to wanting to feel this way or that way. In Tibetan, the word meditation literally means becoming familiar with. Can we, instead of trying to calm the mind and make the the anxiety go away, instead of trying to understand it, can we begin to directly lean into, befriend, that quality of anxiety. It takes training to learn to realize that complete letting go into the spaciousness is comfortable because at first it has that falling quality, that lack of control quality. In some ways, anxiety is very directly about wanting to control, wanting to be in control, wanting to control our lives. And this in between state of letting go and feeling comfort is a lot of the work of practice, can we begin to bear this in-between state, this bardo of not knowing who we're going to be if we let go? Okay, so what I'd like to do now is do a brief guided meditation that explores this quality that I've been talking about. Brief guided meditation. Just bring your attention into your body. Begin to explore trusting, dropping energy out of your head, the desire to understand down into your body, down into your torso, releasing energy downward. Notice that as the senses arise, hearing my voice, feeling your butt on the chair or on the ground, your feet on the floor, wherever. Letting go of identifying with the senses. They're just happening by themselves. Hearing is happening. Sensing is happening. Seeing is happening. Smelling is happening. Dissolving identification with the senses. And then beginning to let go of identifying with thoughts and emotions. Dissolving the thought as it arises, the emotion as it arises.
And then dissolve the observer. Experience arising, consciousness meeting experience. If the I thought arises, just notice that. It's just a thought. I'm doing well, I'm not doing well. I can't, I will. Dissolve all of that. Dissolve trying, trying to do this right. Dissolving into emptiness, into spaciousness. And as you do this, fear might arise. The need to struggle to understand who you are, to be in control. Let go even of identification with the fear. It's not your fear, just fear. Don't struggle. Distraction fueled by anxiety comes from the I needing fearfully to survive. Letting go of all frame of reference for your experience. Not I'm doing anything, experience is happening. Arising out of emptiness, into emptiness. Spacious heart mind. Letting go even of the expectation that I will survive this meditation. Whether the mind is moving, whether the mind is calm, resting in this moment. The fundamental deception is the need to survive. This anxiety that I need to survive, which causes aggression, lack of space, and all suffering. Resting in this spaciousness. Thoughts continue, emotions continue possibly, sensations arising from emptiness into emptiness. Experiencing this directly, nakedly, Stabilizing this familiarity with emptiness that is fundamentally uninterrupted by any experience. Noticing anxiety if and when it arises.
as our practice deepens, we can go beyond the I that continually seeks comfort, discovering that we're big enough to hold something that's neither pure nor impure. But we have to first appreciate the richness of this groundless state and be able to rest there, to stabilize in trusting spaciousness. From this spaciousness, compassion is revealed. Before this spaciousness, we cultivate a dualistic compassion for the place that fear arises, anxiety generates ego clinging. What we're talking about today can also be approached from a much more devotional standpoint, having faith in the mantra, in the guru, in the mother. Imagine that you were just resting in mantra, that you were saying Ram, Ram, Ram constantly. Maharaji had a journal every day. He'd write down a day's worth of Rams. And Ram Das jokingly called that his journal. Those were all the things that Maharaji did or saw or thought about. It's just Ram, Ram, Ram. So that instead of worrying about the future, planning how to do things well, that's where mine goes, my mind goes when I'm working from this state of anxiety. How can I plan for the future? So it turns out with as few obstacles as possible, how I can protect myself, how I can stay in some control. If I begin to notice that quality of anxiety, instead of investigating it in the way we've been talking about, what does it feel like? Can I lean into it? That could be the impulse to go directly into devotion, go to directly into mantra. Uh, you might notice if you've done kirtan that singing to God, even with a lot of other people in the room, where there's a very joyful feeling that again and again, the mind goes back to I. It has a hard time resting in that devotion. It's exactly the same process that we're talking about here. Finding that quality of trusting the emptiness, trusting the heart. The mind creates the abyss. The mind creates the anxiety. The heart crosses the abyss. Is it possible then to trust in God rather than try to figure things out as Maharaji suggested? not trying to figure things out. That's coming from the place of anxiety, becoming one with experience, surrendering. In some way, this is the most simple and also the most complex talk that I think I've ever given. There's a very simple, simple thing to do, but it's a very not easy thing to do, right? Can we begin to make friends with that anxiety, that thing that's creating the I, the need to control, the clinging? Okay, anybody want to say something? Uh, Ramdev? Yes, John. So Paula posted in the chat, how did Maharaji define dream? That quote that life is completely real, is completely a dream. Yes. And, and it's both at the same time. Well, first of all, Maharaji never defined anything. <laughs> Maharaji was not a teacher in the usual sense. He didn't. He didn't expound on the scriptures. He didn't give nuanced conversations about anything. He would just say, love everybody, remember God, feed people, be good. You know, he didn't, he didn't get into any of the nuances particularly. And in the context of that particular conversation, somebody had been asking him about this, this uh, concept of the emptier dreamlike nature of things. Although Maharaji certainly wasn't a Buddhist, sometimes we'd be in front of him and somebody would have a Buddhist scripture and he'd take the book and he'd look at it. He wouldn't open it up at all. He said, this is a really good book, <laughs> right? Or he'd put it on top of his head and says, yes, this is, this is it. Or one time somebody had a, uh, their journal there and there was a picture of Buddha. And Maharaji says, who is that? And the person, that's Buddha. 
And Maharaj says, no, that's Maharaji. Or it might have been the other way. Krishnas and I have opposite recollections. Maybe it was a picture of Maharaji. And he said, no, it's, it's Buddha. But the point is that he was very tuned into that the essential teachings of Buddhism are the essential teachings of Hinduism of all contemplative mystical paths, the paths that go beyond the mind that understands. So that when we're when he was using this word, life is a dream, I'm sure he was referring to this quality that we've been exploring here today. I, he would say, I'm not this body. The guru is not the body. Uh, you people are mistaken thinking that I am this body. He was pure consciousness, as is everybody. So the difference between Maharaji and Buddha and Christ on one hand and you and me on the other hand is that we're all pure consciousness. They realize and stabilize that, that knowledge. We keep forgetting that and get lost in the sense that this is real. Well, it is real, but it's real in the context of wholeness. And when you have the experience of emptiness, it's like, like taking a psychedelic that you realize this is the nature of things. This is the way it is. I may go back to my delusion of I'm lost in all this stuff. But once you have the direct experience of emptiness, it's not a dream. It's what the dream is contextualized in. I just spent the last five days in Colorado with a very, very dear friend of mine who has really advanced cancer. There's some chance some miraculous drug might help him extend his life some, and there's a chance he could die today, literally. As I was with him and his children and their, their partners and his wife, there was both of these things going on. It was, it was really brought into focus by being around somebody who, quote, is dying. And I, I hope Peter doesn't die. I hope, I mean, I hope he doesn't die soon. Let's leave it at that. But it was clear that there was this very sad thing going on. We'd be sitting at the, the table and he would be overwhelmed with emotion and start weeping at dinner because people were loving him so much. And at the same time, there was something going on that was all dreamlike and whole and empty. Life and death are really not two different things. I don't remember if I told this story lately or not, but the last time I took acid, a long time ago, it was 40 years ago or something, maybe, I don't know. I was still living in Santa Cruz with Ram Dass and my friend Richard, the other Richard. And Richard and I went to a beach in, in Big Sur. We took acid with Richard's semi-enlightened golden retriever, Crandall. At the end of the day, we were walking from the beach to up where the car was. And it was a very steep path, very steep. It wasn't really a clip, but it was really steep going from the beach up to the car. And as I was walking up, I turned around, I looked at the ocean. I could see the little waves all over the place and these big, big patterns of currents where there was brownish water and bluish water. And I realized that life was like that. There was all these tiny little things happening all the time, but there's great big patterns. And somehow I realized that life and death were like that. And it didn't make any difference that if I let go of what I was holding on to and fell down and died to the bottom of the, the, the trail there, the almost cliff-like place I was, it didn't make any difference at all. I thought, well, Dale, you're really high right now. So Maybe it's better not to do that because maybe tomorrow you wouldn't have the same opinion. And obviously I didn't do it, but it was just clear that life and death, it's all part of the, the, the dream in a certain way. When I was with Peter, both of those things were going on at the same time. The dreamlike nature of a friend dying and how real it was, how poignant it was, how heartbreaking it was in a certain way. So that's Maharaj saying they're, it's both at the same time. It's real and it's dreamlike. Anybody else? You said something in the meditation that really felt profound that, that I would love to hear you expand on, which is the fundamental delusion is I need to survive. And that idea of survival feels like it's come to us in so many ways, whether it's 
you know, in our bodies biologically, this drive to survive, or whether it's, you know, even conditioned statements like survival of the fittest that we've all kind of been in the soup of. And I wonder if you could just speak to how do we recognize that delusion of I need to survive and start to move through that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And that was, of course, the essence of what that meditation was about. In a way, the underlying point of what I'm talking about today is that that anxiety uncovers that need to survive. That anxiety is the direct result of I need to survive. The anxiety is so constant that we often don't notice that it's there at all. There's no content, there's, there's very little contrast to the anxiety. Then that's what meditation is about. That's what devotion is about. That there begins to become some contrast that, oh, here's some freedom from that fundamental anxiety that I need to survive. And we begin to feel the narrowness of it, the, the constriction of it, the tightness of it. Usually in the past, we've been talking about grosser emotions. Anger arises, it, passes, it passes away, or grief arises, and then it comes and goes, right? And here we're talking about something that's so constant that it's hard to notice. Maybe for some of you during that guided meditation, you notice that when I said, let go of the senses, let go, dissolve the, the identification with thoughts and emotions, dissolve the identification of the observer. And at certain points, anxiety and or fear began to arise. I want some control here. And it's just learning to be comfortable with that, that gradually, gradually trusting that it's safe. Suzuki Roshu, who has all the best quotes, he said something like, there's two words that explain all of Buddhism. Just let go. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, Ramda, uh, Doug has his hand up. I know he does. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Dale. Um, anxiety is a wonderful topic uh, to me. Um, I've, I've been reading uh, recently um, an author named Bruce Tift, who himself is a student of Trungpa. And he distinguishes between, I think, three kinds of anxiety. One is the, a uh, couple of them informed by evolution, evolutionary biology. One is the anxiety that prompts you to step out of the path of an oncoming bus, which is survival. Uh, second is anxiety that keeps you from entering emotionally toxic situations, being around uh, people, for example, who might be harmful, uh, emotionally harmful. Uh, the third one is really the most interesting in a way because that gets at the anxiety we have over the uh, emptiness of self and that we're not really real. And so I think that is the one where meditation really um, enters the picture in a very useful way. And maybe that's the anxiety in a way that's the hardest to welcome. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And yet, I've been having this experience and this sort of slightly aha moment for myself that is, it is anxiety that is the gateway to the way out of all other suffering, right? That it's, it's a little more subtle. It's not as noticeable as a, a, a burst of anger, a burst of grief, a burst of happiness, a burst of joy. Most people are living with this underlying baseline uh, somebody once said that anxiety is the baseline of a quartet, that it, it's going on in the background. You don't really hear the bass very much. You're listening to the melody. You're, there's the, whatever it is, the saxophone or the violin, depending on what kind of a quartet it is, of course. The bass line is there, but that's not what you're paying attention to. You're getting lost in the more exciting part, right? Or the more in the forefront part, if you will. And to begin to realize that the, the the baseline, the anxiety, is kind of propping the whole thing up in a way. It's it's creating the foundation for the music, and being with that and and dissolving identification with that is a very productive practice. Hello, um, I just wanted to share some thoughts. Um, I particularly found uh, your comment about 
this quality of like nothingness being constantly present kind of no matter what um, relevant uh, because I've often had like this experience where I feel like I have like these sort of metaphorical sunglasses on just throughout the day and then out of nowhere I'll sort of get hit with like an overwhelming uh, very intense feeling of anxiety where I have this realization of very similar to what you're talking about in the sense of this is real and then it also isn't Mm -hmm. Um, and it washes over me and then I feel that anxiety and, (laughs) and it's just my brain can't sort of handle it and so then I'll put the sunglasses right back on just because it is so overwhelming but it continually comes back Uh um and so when you were talking about that I um found myself just to be very grateful and also relevant just because of how sort of prevalent this experience of like kind of existing as my baseline with these sunglasses on and then out of nowhere it's like the wind would like blow them off my face and I'm like what just happened here let me put them back on um so yes thank you very much so that's a that's a beautiful description Meadows and the more you can get comfortable with without the sunglasses on it and for almost everybody it's a very gradual process but a couple of things you said really interested me one was this notion of it throws you into your mind the anxiety can you use that as an inspiration to go into your heart? The mind creates the abyss, the heart crosses it. Can you, when you're lost in the anxiety, can you have compassion for that place? It really isn't nothingness. I think that's, I, I don't want to argue here about semantics too much, but to think of it as nothingness, I think is unnecessarily daunting. Emptiness is not nothingness. There's this great quote by Meister Eckhart where he says, when the mind is empty of things, it is full of God. When it is full of things, it is empty of God. So this emptiness is not nothingness. It's fullness of presence. It's fullness of beingness. I don't want to live in nothingness. And, and I think a lot of people, I'm not saying this is true about you at all, but a lot of people think that Buddhism is about nothingness and everything gets even and gray and not very passionate. And it's just the opposite of that, that the emptiness is so full of technicolor, right? It's so full of passion and aliveness. And I think you know that. I think maybe you just used the wrong word there. Okay, so we have three people lights up here who want to say something. Oh, um, thank you. I got hit by a car in February, and I had brain damage and all kinds of other damage some of which is healing. Um, But I don't feel like the same person. And I don't know if that is really brain damage or if it's a kind of a spiritual thing going on because I went through the grief before when my husband died and I thought I was kind of getting a handle on it and then bang, I'm just run over. But I I really appreciate your talks about um, like Maharaji saying you know what's the difference I don't know but uh, it's a, an experience I'm going through and um, so thanks for your talk today. You're very welcome. I'm so sorry about what you went through and I remember that your dog died in that accident. I'm equally sorry about that. Yeah. And. Uh, I understand that the mind would be curious and asking, am I feeling this because it's a spiritual thing or it's a, it's a medical thing, right? And I guess I would say it probably fundamentally doesn't make any difference that this is who you are now. And is it possible to be with the, the relationship with I in this different body with this different brain and use it as productively as you can. I, 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 it's, a, it's, it's, it's a sad thing that it happened, but it has happened. Uh, Ramdas had a stroke, etc. And 
how much more compassion can you have for yourself? How much more can you love yourself, be intimate with yourself? Not in spite of the accident, but maybe even because of it. I'm so often with people who are approaching death and they're busy comparing themselves with who they used to be. When they could walk around or they could go to the bathroom by themselves or they could eat solid food or whatever it is that they can't do anymore. And to the extent that they're they're focusing on that that separation, it's very painful. We had I had a client at the dying center, it was the last guy who lived there before we closed the place up. He said, I used to love playing basketball. I can't do that anymore. I used to love eating chili rianos. I can't do that anymore. I used to love going to the bathroom by myself. I can't do that anymore. But I feel like I'm being whittled down to my essential self. And there's something really wonderful that's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's loss, but there's also what is it that's being lost? And, and being with what remains as fully and genuinely as possible. I wish you all the best. I truly do. Thank you. Ah, yes. Uh, thanks, Ramda. Talking about this need to survive, letting to go of the need to survive, strikes me as something that we will experience at some point in the dying process. And it'll be like imposed upon us right in a non-negotiable way and is it okay that i mentioned that you have a critical illness hope it is because i did um it, it's okay i guess since you've already done it it's fine <laughs> but what i'm saying is then this practice of of meditating on emptiness is practice for death yeah, for sure. Very, very directly. The, the comment I like to make here, though, is that it's not that we're letting go of the need to survive. We're letting go of the I that needs to survive. If you think yeah. I need to let go of needing to survive, you're putting yourself in a, in a kind of a conundrum there. Because the eye that thinks it's need to survive doesn't really exist in the first place. And so it's it's letting go of who we think we are rather and then then the need to survive really changes. And maybe, maybe for you and for everybody, there's something that doesn't die. Maybe who we really are doesn't die. Yeah, the the one more thing about that is is that I, I was thinking of what it takes of just being in a frame of mind of, let's say, having mercy for the one who thinks he needs to survive. Yeah, definitely. And it dawned on me that the portal to transcendence is a heart full of mercy. Here, here. Compassion, compassion for self, compassion for all beings. Thank you. Wishing you all the best. In the meditation, you talked about dissolving the your sense of self. And I'm just wondering, it seems so advanced. And I didn't know how to do that without just more thinking of how to dissolve it. Like it just keeps skidding. I just keep referring back to just thinking about doing things. So how would you describe being able to do that? That guided part was preceded by saying, dissolving your senses, dissolving your thoughts, dissolving your emotions. So that you'll notice that right now you'll hear the sound of my voice and then it goes away and then it comes back again. Hearing is coming and going, coming and going. You're looking at the screen maybe and back and forth between seeing and thinking and hearing and all those things. One thing that when the mind gets a little quieter, and admittedly we did something, that guided meditation took about 10 minutes, maybe a little longer, I don't know. And it's really something that could better take 10 hours of like really going into 
each of those, those, those steps, which I would encourage people to do. When the mind begins to get a little quieter, you, you begin to see that a lot of the thinking is based in the notion of I. I'm not doing this well enough. I need to understand what he's saying so I can do it better. I'm getting tired of doing this. Uh, I'd rather like to think about another thing. So that a lot of thinking is based on this notion of I. And if you look at it clearly enough, you'll see that it's just the concept that comes and goes. In neuroscience, I guess you'd say, if you hook people up to a functional magnetic imaging machine and ask them to think about I, there's not one place. There's a bunch of places. There's a bunch of concepts. And think about not I, it's a bunch of different places. There's not, there, there's not a place. There's not a fixed, solid thing that's I. It's, it's a set of concepts. When I say letting go of I, it's the notion of I arises. And you see, that's just another thought. It's just another thought like, what's for lunch? You don't have to take it super seriously. It's okay, there's the I. And that's the I that's been causing a lot of problems for me all along, probably. But it's not going to go away. It's just not going to be identified with it in the same way. So that emptiness isn't changing necessarily what we're perceiving, but how we are perceiving it. It's our relationship with the I thought. It's our relationship with what we're hearing and doing. And the same stuff is more than likely in slightly altered forms going to be arising in your life, but you're relating to it from this place of emptiness, of spaciousness, of lack of anxiety, so that the I can still be there. It's not something you're trying to defeat. There's not a civil war going on inside of your brain. There's this you who's sitting in a chair in whatever place you're sitting in, and you've got this life, and you've got pictures on the wall and stuff hanging on the door, and those are the things that are going on. But there's no grasping involved anymore. The eye's not going to disappear. It's just the identification with it will disappear. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck with that. Okay. Good luck with not letting go of the eye to all of us, <laughs> to identification with the eye. It's the work of a lifetime for many of us, many, many lifetimes. But... It's the road to freedom. And, you know, I, when I began practice, I thought that I was going to let go of all these things. And it's not really letting go as much as letting be. There's still Dale. There's still neurotic Dale. And it's okay now. <laughs> it's okay to be neurotic. I mean, that's what I'm stuck with. And that's who I am. <laughs> I have gone through periods that sometimes takes years, if not decades, where I'm really focusing on mindfulness and Vipassana and cultivating a calmer, more focused mind. And then there are times that I'm much more focused on devotion or on wisdom practices and learning to really trust myself. I had the advantage of being probably one of the older people in this room and having some wonderful, wonderful teachers back in the late 20th century, some of the best meditation masters alive at that point. It's a different time than it was then. I mean, I put my life on hold to go around finding teachers. Most of us don't have that luxury anymore. You've got a life to live. You can ask the universe. You can ask God, please bring the teaching that I need now. I feel like I need the next thing. What is it? And they say, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I think that even now, that's true. That if you, if you really want the next thing, if you feel that what you've done, you've come to the end of, and it's ripe and it's time to do the next thing, then ask. Ask from your heart and it will appear. Okay. Let me just say one thing from my heart here. To me, what we've been talking about today is going to the heart of the matter, literally and figuratively. That place where I'm feeling that who I am is inadequate, that I need to fix, that I need to figure things out, that something's wrong, that I need to plan, to I need to stay in control, that I, I, I. We have parts of our lives where we trust the surrender into wholeness. 
Maybe it's in music, maybe it's in cooking, maybe it's in hiking in nature, whatever it is for you. And maybe it's being around my friend Peter who was so sick. What is the essential thing to do? What is the way that I can find that place in me where I can be compassion, not do compassion for myself and for Peter and for you? And to me, it's bearing the surrender from living in the tightness of anxiety into the spaciousness of the empty nature of reality itself. And it's very challenging. It's very challenging because when we were very young, we were taught, and it's in our um, the way we breathe at the end of the out breath. It's in the way we think. It's in the way we move our bodies that the world isn't safe, that we've got to be concerned about things, that we've got to protect ourselves, that who we are is maybe something we could be we should be ashamed of at times. And the way we did things we should be feeling guilty about because it's not the way somebody told us that maybe it should have been done. So there's a lot of conditioning that makes it hard to do this simple thing. But once again, what do you really want? Do you want to be free of the, the tightness, the, the sense of this lack of freedom that is the grasping to this this notion of I. It's only a concept. It's a very real concept and we, we can use it skillfully, but it's something that is the root cause of all suffering. And my hope is that you be free of that suffering, my deepest hope. Okay, let's just have a very short meditation here at the end keeping in mind all the stories we've heard, the real stories, people who are ill, people who are grieving, people who want deeper answers, keeping in mind how letting go of this grasping has been so challenging in your life up until this moment. So can we then invoke that which the heart trusts? That which is beyond the mind that wants to understand, the mind that wants to fix and control. Invoking in the sense of trusting that even when the I thought arises, even the anxiety is exposed, that is generating this tightness in your life, that that is the next step on the healing process. You can be with this. You can be with this with an open heart. You can have compassion for all the suffering that has brought you to this moment. the suffering that you felt in yourself and that you see all around. Each moment surrendering into this spacious heart And when you start getting lost, start drowning in conceptuality of who I am and what I need to do, can you open your heart even to that? Rather than trying to figure it out just for these few minutes. There's something in you that is so much more deeply trustworthy than you think there is. Just the way you are, 
so beautiful. Thoughts, emotions, perceptions continue to arise, pass away. Each arising having the quality of emptiness, impermanence. and can be met with love, can be met with anxiety. Ain't no judgment when the anxiety arises. In truth, the anxiety is showing us the way home, pointing at the fundamental mistake We are free already. This freedom is expressed as compassion for all other beings. Everyone also experiences this acute yearning to not suffer. Trusting the spacious heart, trusting compassion. Very grateful for this community, for people's willingness to be vulnerable and to trust. I really don't feel like I'm a teacher particularly. I've had a lot of experiences that I can share. I've had a lot of blessings fall in my life. But I want you to really realize that I think that your part in what we've done today is equally important to mine and equally special and crucial. And uh, I really appreciate your patience and your trust and your kindness. I look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>